bit about uh, the impact of, that Slepershev is seeming to have with uh, averaging 10 minutes of ice time a night. And he, he's starting to look comfortable. He's starting to make plays. Uh, Oiler fans don't know a whole lot about this kid. What can you tell them? Well, I, if you actually described him pretty well. You, you probably answered your own question. He is looking comfortable. He's making uh, some good plays, and he's taking advantage of 10 minutes a night. That line um, in particular has found a little bit of chemistry, and uh, it's been productive throughout the playoffs, and we need that to continue. Todd, uh, Adam Larson was just saying that, um, you know, last summer being involved in that big trade, uh, he was able to kind of put it past him pretty much immediately. Did you see that as well from him, and how he kind of dealt with that and how he's become, you know, an impact player? And Yeah, I, I think he's done a, a tremendous job with that. Um, you know, I think we've all put that, that trade behind us. It, it seems to keep coming up from, from out in all of those seats. And, um, you know, we're in the middle of a, of a tough grinding series, and, and we've got to get over the trade. Um, it's not fair to Taylor Hall. It's not fair to Adam. It's it's about the two teams that are playing now, and um, he's done a good job of of fitting our team, and he's uh, he's left his mark. He's an Oiler now, and uh, we wouldn't expect any less from him moving forward. Todd, uh, I'm sure you've been asked before about Leon and maybe being quote unquote overlooked, um, but you know, it's a top ten scorer in this league uh, whatsoever. But do you think he likes maybe flying under the radar or flying, you know, with, with Connor obviously drawing a lot of attention whatsoever. Do you think he likes that, that most of the attention is maybe there and that he can sort of... Um, I think if I, if I answered that question and said, yes, he does, um, that would uh, demean his approach to the game. He, he doesn't mind stepping up and putting himself out there. Um, the fact is that Connor does get most of the... Uh, the shadowing and the um, the checking and that type of stuff, and, and in turn it leaves Leon open. But uh, I don't think Leon would shy away from the fact that he could be a go-to guy or, or is a go-to guy if, if Connor wasn't in the lineup or wasn't on our team. I think he has that ability and, and those broad shoulders to, to accept that role. Um, so I have to watch how I answer that question because he's, uh, he's willing to accept that. Well, that's part of that's the the captaincy. Um, you know, we we knew and Connor knew, and we all accepted the fact that when you put the C on your jersey, you accept much more of that responsibility. You answer for the group more often than not. Um, you talk about situations that are beyond you as an individual in in the team environment. You talk about the team as a whole when you're a captain. Uh, Leon doesn't have to do a lot of that, so it does take. Uh, you know, it does take Leon out of that situation a little bit more. Um, you know, I thought you were talking more on the ice, but uh, that role is a little bit different for sure. Uh, Todd, Mark Letestu did not start the year on your power play. He had to get there. What did you see that made you want to put him there? And how, when, when he's playing with such high-skilled players and playmakers, how essential is it on a power play to have a guy like him who knows that he's coming in to shoot if he gets the opportunity? Well, and, and, and that's exactly it. The, he's prepared to shoot it. He doesn't defer to to others on that power play. And the fact that he's willing to shoot makes it work. Um, when when we talk about test and, and fitting that power play, he's a very, very bright hockey player. He, you know, if I was going to pick a, an individual in the locker room uh, that eventually might lead a team somewhere, coach, uh, with his, using his hockey acumen or IQ, it would be a test. Um, so he, he can make adjustments personally, he can make adjustments with a group, he sees it happen, he understands concepts. Um, so he fits that group well, um, physically and mentally. Uh, back to Slepeshev, when you have a, a young guy who doesn't speak English real well, uh, he's far from home, you know. He's been up and down for the minors. You got no other Russians on your team to help him. Uh, what's it as a coach? What are the things you have to do to make sure that he stays part of the group and doesn't slide away from that? Well, based on my experience, I think every 
European players a little bit different. They their own personal um, traits and personalities um, affect how they fit in and, and how they operate. Language is a big thing. Um, Schlepp has picked up a lot of English. Don't let him trick you. He knows more than uh, than he lets on. And um, you know, the, with him, his work ethic and his ability to to stay with it. Persistence, resiliency. Um, you know, when it wasn't going good for him, he even went down this year for a little while to work on his game and came back. Teammates recognize that; they notice it. Uh, they're more accepting of it when he fights through it. And uh, Anton has all those qualities, so he's very, very well received in the locker room. His teammates uh, appreciate what he does and how often he does it. Uh, sorry, Todd, to your left. Just talking about European players and back to Leon for a second. A little, a little bit maybe about his journey coming over here as a young kid, uh, having a dream in a country where hockey is a little bit down the list when it comes to sports. Can you discuss just how he's come over here and, and the dream lives on and how important he is to your team and this playoff run? Well, it's we talk about the country. I think more of the family. Hockey's in, in his blood over there. Obviously, his father played, and when you grow up, you know, Canada's a hockey country, but if you grew up in a basketball family, you're probably passionate about it. Um, that was Leon's case in, in hockey. He, uh, he was aware that at, at a young age he had a lot of talent. I'm sure he was. I'm, maybe I'm speaking for him, but um, that he had to find the right path to, to grow his skills. He chose to come over and play major junior and um, you know, was drafted early, uh, put into a league where he... Uh, at times was ready, at other times he wasn't, and he was challenged. He was pushed, and the biggest and most important thing with him is he accepted that challenge, and he's he's turned himself into the player he is. Um, it wasn't magic or anything like that. He's worked at it. <clears throat> Todd, how much is your team defying the odds with your list of game-winning goal scorers? You know, Dayarne, Slapashev, and now Larson last night, Cassian as well. I don't know. Um, I'm not an odds maker. I'm not, uh, you know, when you t begin to talk about odds, you begin to talk about gambling. I don't think we're gambling. We're just playing hockey, and uh, it ends up on somebody's tape, and they shoot it in the net. There's not a script that you have to follow in playoffs. There's not, uh, you know, I've, I've said this about eight times already uh, because of the Connor factor. You don't win based on one individual shoulders. You win on a on a team by team or a player by player and, and a team environment. And, um, you know, different guys are putting it at the net uh, at different times. It's, it's real important for that to happen in the playoffs. It has to continue for us. Todd, did your challenge coming when it did, when Anaheim tied it at three all, have an effect intended or not of just settling it down just a bit on the bench? What gave us a little bit of time to regroup, um, you know, talk about things. The, the, the coach's challenge has that effect sometimes, but it was a legitimate challenge. We thought we could, could uh, you know, affect the outcome of the call and um, didn't work our way um, in the call itself, but it, it did give us a little bit of time. Those two goals came pretty quick. Um, there was energy back in the building. It gave us a little time to, to slow things down, take a deep breath, have all four lines rested and ready to play again and mentally recover. Can, can you expand a little more on Latestu and what you were getting at there? Um, I mean, he just said Elk Point and Bonneville's going nuts right now. And just the, for him to get to where he is and, you know, he's just, the magnitude is amazing. It's a great story because if you went and, you know, I, I don't know how Test broke into the league. I couldn't tell you his history or, or um, you know, what Columbus saw in him. But um, after having, sometimes you have to have players in your environment and they have to be around you to really appreciate them. And uh, it's a great story for, uh, for an Alberta kid to come home and play for, uh, for Edmonton. Um, and as you mentioned, his, his home community and the, his junior community has got to be awfully proud of what he's done. And I'm sure they're backing him 100% uh, at this point. Uh, yeah, Todd, we, we know now that Jumbo played the first round series with two torn ligaments in his knee. I wanted you to maybe react to that, um, you know, his gutting that out and taking that risk. And I also wanted to ask you, um, you know, what's, what's the most severe thing you've seen somebody play through in, in your career? Well, Jumbo, uh, 
I think in that, that series, uh, as it started, um, I made the, uh, the point of saying we're planning um, as if he was playing. And we knew he was going to play at some point. I've watched him play with broken fingers, um, separated shoulders. He is cut from the old cloth, if you will. And uh, there was no doubt in my mind he was playing. They'd have to cut his leg off if he wasn't going to come back. And, and he just needed a few days to, to recover. And, and that speaks volumes of his character, his strength, his toughness. Um, you know, you can go on and on and describe uh, what he does. But, um, you know, as far as the, the worst injury I've seen, I don't know. You, you, we're all around hockey. And there isn't a healthy player playing right now. You know, if, you find, if, if you've got a healthy player, he hasn't played in three weeks. Uh, everybody's got bumps and bruises. It's the it's the dramatic injury, as Jumbo's was, that that makes the news. But it's the buildup of injuries that wins you series. Um, you know the the bruises, the bumps, the um, the pain, the fatigue. Uh, it's it's the buildup of that that gets you through a series, and then you got to reload again. Um, uh, Todd, uh, you've coached against Ryan Nugent Hopkins for a number of years before you started coaching Ryan Nugent Hopkins. What's the transition like from his game from being that kind of sort of young, I mean, he still is really young, but I mean, that kind of scoring center to a, a real two-way player, and, and what's the commitment been like on his end to try to make that transition? His commitment level's been extremely high. He wants to win. Uh, Nugent wants to win. Um, he wants to be part of, of something that, that is successful and, and win. And he knows that he needed, or he believed he needed to do certain things uh, to do that. And it's hard for, for young players, the first overall picks that come out of junior, they're counted on to play 30 minutes a night sometimes. They get to stay on the ice as long as they want. I'm not saying Nooch did these things, but they, uh, the lifeline in junior goes through those dominant guys. And they get to, uh, they get to produce offensively at will and um, sometimes they cut corners and cheat and do things like that. Um, Nuge has become a much more complete player and again I'm not insinuating that Nuge was doing all of those things in junior nor was he doing them here in pro uh, but when you're those top three or four picks um, you don't necessarily have carte blanche but you you get to play with uh, a much much longer leash in junior you get to to play with uh, a little more freedom and you're expected to produce 120, 130 points a year. Uh, it doesn't happen in the NHL. We, well, we had one guy get 100 points. That's it. A uh, couple of things here, Todd. At what point does a coach stand behind the bench when, when a player is checking Connor and you say, are you not going to call a penalty on that? I mean, the, the hacking, the whacking, the slashing of the back of the legs. And at what point do you say, OK, you guys are seeing it. You must be your referees and stuff. And the fans are seeing it. But you just let him get away with it? Like, we're talking Kessler, obviously. And second part is uh, <laughs> Coach of the Year. I just need to comment on your finalist Coach of the Year. Well, maybe I can wrap the answer up there. Um, I don't own a black and white striped suit, so I don't get to ref. Um, I have to coach back there, and you take what you get. And uh, they're doing – everybody that's involved in the game right now, the final eight to the final four to the final two, um, it gets weeded out. The, the best stay involved, and that includes the officials. They're doing uh, as good a job as they possibly can, and um, sometimes they see things, sometimes they don't. It's, it's a tough job. Um, you know, the coaching part of it, I, I mentioned last night, it's not an individual thing. Um, for me, by any means, we have a, an incredible staff that, that really works uh, diligently night in and night out to, uh, to prepare the group. They've created strong relationships and bonds with the players. The trust factor is where it needs to be. Um, you can take it even further. The training staff, the medical uh, staff, the, the scouting, it, that's all part of, of the uh, Jack Adams Award, I believe. And, you know, I, I, you can't win the Derby on a donkey is a, is a um, saying that I have, and I often use it. You know, you have to have good people. You have to have good players. And then you have a chance to win the Derby, and, and um, that's where we're at. It's not, it's not the jockey or the horse, it's the whole stable.